in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you on this first Sunday in the new year. It's a good way to start the year off by being in God's house on the Lord's Day. And we most certainly appreciate your presence. And we welcome the visitors that's visiting with us today. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in Athens, Georgia, the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you. And if you get on your phone, you're in the radio listening audience, call a friend. Have them to tune in and get this hour. I believe they'd appreciate it. I know we would. And you'd be doing them a favor. I want you to turn first of all to Isaiah chapter 5. Then I want you to turn to Luke chapter 13. I do hope you've enjoyed the song service today and it's proven a blessing to you. Now the singing and the message will be on cassette tape. And this cassette tape will be tape number 160, 160. We're sending these cassette tape out to you that write in and request them and send in a gift of $3 for each tape. And the gift is used to help pay for radio time. We have a great number of tapes. I have a list of some 158. We'd be glad to send you a list of our tape if you'd like to have them. And so we'll send you a list of these. You can write in for the ones you'd like to have by number or by title. And pray for us. Pray for this whole mission work. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. I know you want to do all you can for God doing this year. We never know what the year may bring forth. You don't have to leave anything undone or leave anything behind. I'm reminded of the man that was stopped beside the highway because he had a defective taillight. The trooper stopped him and went out to check the taillight on his automobile and began to write out her ticket. And the man seemed to be very nervous and all shaken up about it. And the trooper looked at him and said, Man, there's no need of you being so nervous, so shaken up. It's just a little defective taillight. It won't amount to much. He said, Sir, I'm not worried about that taillight. So I'm wondering what happened to my trailer and my wife. So sometimes you can uh, leave things behind and not realize it until it's too late. In Isaiah chapter 5, Beginning with verse 1. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fished it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. And built a tower in the midst of it. And also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than I've done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste. It shall be pruned, not digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that the rain, that the rain not fall upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah in his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but he had oppression for righteousness, and behold, a cry. Now that's reading from Isaiah chapter 5, the first seven verses. I want you to turn to another place in the Bible. And that is Luke chapter 13, page 1094 in the original Schofield reference Bible. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading four verses, beginning with verse 6. And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down while cometh it to ground. And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. 
Now my text is selected from a little phrase found here in verse 8. Let it alone this year also. This year also. Now we're now entering into a new year. And last Sunday I spoke on the subject in the year. And so today I want to speak on the subject this year also. Now the message last Sunday and the message today should help us help get us off on the right foot in this new year to be used to the glory of God. Now if you notice here something about a barren fig tree. We spoke about, read about a vineyard brother in Isaiah. Now this is primarily to Israel. God took them out of a barren Egypt and planted them in fertile Canaan. Christ sought for fruit from them for three years and found none. Israel was then cut off and scattered, according to Romans chapter 11 and verse 20. Now there are several things I want to say about this barren fig tree, but keep in mind and apply this to yourself this year also. We're now entering into a new year, and this year also. What are you going to do about it? This year also. And notice a barren fig tree in a land where Jesus walked in his day. He came to the nation of Israel, stayed among them about three years, three and a half years. They produced nothing. And so talking about the barren fig tree should stir us up to be used of God and produce fruit for God in the days that lie ahead. Now the way to produce fruit for God is to glorify God. Glorify God in everything you do. And you'll be fruitful. Several things about this tree. Number one, this tree was chosen and planted in a vineyard. Look at verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereupon and found none. Now notice it was chosen. It was chosen and then it was planted. And it was supplied and was protected. Now, you know something about planting. If you've never worked on a farm, you have maybe a little garden. You've planted flowers and planted seed in your garden. And you know a little something about planting and cultivating and fertilizing. Now, here this man planted a fig tree in his vineyard. He chose this fig tree. He went out and selected this very tree. He said, this is a tree I want. And he selected that little fig tree. And he brought that little tree in and he planted it himself. He supplied the fertilizer. He supplied the soil. It was there. And then he protected that tree. He saw no, that no harm came to it. I'm reminded of many years ago yonder in the state of Tennessee. There was a beautiful little red-headed girl with curls hanging down her back. Very beautiful. But she was an adopted child. She didn't know that until she started the school. And one day in school, some of the school children said to her, Well, your mother and daddy, the people you live with, is not really your mother and daddy, said you've been adopted. And it broke the little girl's heart. She had never been informed about that. And she could hardly wait to get home. She was in tears. And the mother and daddy that adopted her said, Now listen, honey, we want to tell you something, and you listen closely. Said we found out we could have no children of our own. And we wanted a little child more than anything in the world. And he, they said to her, said, you know, we went to the place where they have children to be adopted. And we looked over those children and we saw you. You were the prettiest little red-headed girl we ever laid our eyes on. And we wanted you. And we pleaded for you. And they let us have you. You the very one that we chose. We didn't want the others in that room. There were several in there. Honey, we wanted you. You're the one we wanted. And there's a lot of little girls and boys born in this world. Their parents don't want them. And they're being brought up in a home where they're not wanted. But said, honey, we wanted you. And you're ours. And we love you dearly. We want you to know that. And the little girl began to smile when she realized that she had been wanted. That she had been chosen. That she had been brought to that home. And they loved her dearly. And she was happy thereafter. And nothing else bothered her. She knew that she was wanted. She knew she had been chosen. She knew she was in a good home. Now this man sought out a tree, beautiful little tree. He wanted that tree. He planted that tree. He supplied that tree. He protected that tree. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse 3, 
The Bible said you should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. You're somebody. There's multitudes out here in the land today that's not saved. God planted you. God birthed you into his family. You belong to God. You're in God's vineyard. Secondly, it was owned by a certain man. Now this man owned this little vineyard and he owned this little fig tree. It belonged to him. It didn't belong to his neighbor. It did not belong to his friends. It belonged to him. And did you know today that you're not your own? That you're bought with a price? That you belong to God? Jesus Christ bought you with his own precious blood. Not with silver nor gold, but by his own precious blood he bought you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which you have of God, you are not your own. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. You have no right to say, I'll do just what I want to do and it's nobody's business and I run my own affair and nobody tells me what to do. I'm strictly independent. You belong to God. You can't do everything you would like to do. You must do what God wants you to do. You must find the way God is moving and move with God. You must know the will of the Lord in your life. If you read Romans chapter 12 in the first two verses, read over and over again, you can know the will of God for your life. Then you please the Lord. He owns you. God bought you. God didn't pay for you in silver, gold. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23 that God Almighty bought you with something more precious than silver and something more precious than gold, something more precious than stones. God bought you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So you're not your own anymore. You need to realize that. And during this year, in this year also, you ought to say, Lord, I know I'm not my own. I'm yours. And you take me and mold me and make me and use me to your glory. That will please the God of heaven. You're not your own. Number three, it was planted to bring forth fruit. Now, when this man went out and selected this little fig tree, he didn't select it for a shade. He didn't select it for a flower pot. He did not select this little fig tree for his neighbors to look out the window and say, My, what a beautiful little fig tree. No, sir. When this man went out and took this fig tree up and planted it in his vineyard, he put it there for a purpose. He planted that fig tree to bring forth fruit. Now, God didn't save you to sit on the stool of do nothing and saying, I shall not be moved. God saved you to bring forth fruit. Each one of you that's listening to me today, whether you be in this auditorium or out in the vast radio listening audience, if you're a child of God, you have been bought, you have been saved, you have been selected, you have been chosen, you have been planted for one purpose, and that's to bring forth fruit unto God. You bring forth fruit unto God by glorifying the Lord. Whatever you do to glorify God, you're producing fruit. You need to realize that. And God wants you to glorify Him in your deeds, your acts, your daily activities, your worship, your service, your sacrificial giving. God wants you to glorify Him. And as you do so, you're bringing forth fruit unto God. You need to realize that. Every day you live in your home, Every day you live on your job. Every day you come to the house of God to worship. You can glorify God every day of your life. Every hour of your life. Every minute if you want to. God wants you to glorify him. And so God said now. I'm going this man said I'm going to plant this and to bring forth fruit. In verse 6 a certain man at a fig tree planted his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereupon. And John chapter 15 and verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that he may bring forth fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now Jesus said, My Father is glorified when you bring forth fruit and then you can be my disciples. A disciple is one that follows the Lord. And you can follow God in your business. You can follow God on your job. You can follow God in your home. You can follow God in your community, and God wants you to do so. Jesus said, you can be my disciple if you'll follow me. 
And you can follow the Lord, every one of you. Don't let the devil tell you you're no good. Don't let the devil tell you you can't do it because you can. You can follow God. That brings us to thought number four. And that is the owner came to check the tree for fruit. Look at verse 6. He came and sought fruit thereupon. Now the man that bought this tree, the man that planted this tree, the man that fertilized this ground, the man that protected this tree had a perfect right to come and take a look at that tree and see whether or not it's producing the goods. God Almighty has a perfect right to check your life every day and to check mine to see whether or not we're glorifying Him. God has that right and God will check your life and see how well you're glorifying Him. That man came to that vineyard and he looked that tree over and he didn't see any sign of any fruit. I wonder when God looks at your life and looks at mine, does he see any sign of any fruit to the glory of God? God has that right. He has a right to expect fruit from us. When God saved you, he bought you with his blood, he planted you, he protects you, he chose you. Now God has a perfect right to expect fruit in your life. And if you don't allow God to produce that fruit through you, then it's your own fault. You've been tricked by the devil. Every last one of you can let God produce that fruit in your life if you'll abide in Him and walk with Him. Now, He's disappointed when that's not happening. God is disappointed after what He's done for you. He saved you from hell. He's been good to you. He's blessed you. He's blessed your family. And after what God has done for you, He chose you. He loved you. He planted you. He selected you. And you're not producing that fruit. God has a right to be disappointed in you. And He is. God wants us to glorify Him. Then that brings us to thought number five, and that is the master's complaint. Now this master, this man, had a perfect right to complain about what he saw. In verse 7, Then said he unto the dress of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why let it sap the ground, or come it the ground. Now here is the master's complaint. He said, I see no fruit. And for three years I've come checking for fruit and found none. And that tree is doing nothing but sapping the ground. The roots is going down in the earth. It's taking in the fertilizer. It's, it's producing nothing. He said, I'm just going to cut it down. I remember the man that always complained about his corn crop. If he didn't have a good corn crop, he complained about it. One year he had an abundant crop, everything fully grown, full ears of corn, stalks loaded. And some of the neighbors came by and said, well, old man said, you always grumble about the drought and grumble about a poor corn crop. Said, you have a perfect crop out there. Now, how about that? He said, I'm unhappy. I'm dissatisfied. Said, when you have a perfect crop like that, said it pulls more upon the soil than it would have had if I just had about half that much. And he said, not only that, now here I am loaded with big ears of corn and don't have any nubbins whatsoever for my uh, hogs. And there he was grumbling about a perfect crop. And you have a lot of people like that. You have some people murmur about the kind of coffin you bear them in. And so this man here, he was long suffering he, for three long years. He came looking for fruit on that fig tree and didn't even see a bud, not even a leaf. Three long years. Notice his weary patience. Finally his patience ran out. What did he say to the man that looked after the vineyard? He said, get the axe, cut it down. I don't want that tree out here in my vineyard sapping the ground, playing the hypocrite, producing nothing. I want it out of the way. Move it out of the way. I'll plant a tree there that'll do the good. And he said, cut it down. Now notice thought number six, and that is... The solemn question, why cometh it to ground? Verse 7. In other words, why leave that tree there when it's doing nothing in the world but sapping the ground? It's doing nothing in the world but standing in the way. I could put a tree there that produced the goods. He said, no need to leave that thing there. It's no good. Why let it drain the ground? Why let it hinder the other trees around it and take strength from the ground that they could use? Why let it stand when another's going to be put in his place? Why let it be a pretender? 
Now there stood a tree pretending that it was going to produce the goods, but it didn't. Year after year, he came and the tree looked pretty good the first year. He said, now, I believe if I wait another year, the old tree's looking pretty good. I, maybe I'll get some fruit from it. Back the second year, the same way. The third year, the same way. It was a pretender. Now, God doesn't want you to be a pretender this year. God wants you to be a reality. God wants you to be real and genuine in serving Him. Not a pretender. Not pretend you're serving God. Not pretend you're glorifying God. God wants the real thing out of you. This year also. Now notice number seven then. The dresser's intercession. The dresser of the vineyard made intercession for the fig tree. Notice verses eight and nine. And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I dig about it and fertilize it. And if it bear fruit, well, if not, then after that, Thou shalt cut it down. Now the intercessor said to the master, said, Sir, let's give it one more chance. I'll dig all around it, and I'll refertilize it, and I'll do everything I can, sir, and, and maybe this year also it'll produce. Let's give it one more chance, sir. Let it stay there another year, and I'll do all in my power to make that tree produce. Now he pleaded for more grace, for more time. In verse 8 he said, this year also, this year also. Maybe in years gone by you've been a little negligent. You've been jealous about serving God. You haven't been faithful. It could be that the intercessor said to the father, I might as well take the tree off. It's not going to produce. And the intercessor, your advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, let's, let's give them another year and see what they'll do. God knows how many today that haven't produced fruit for God. And uh, Jesus said, Father, let's give them a one more year. And if they don't produce this year, then we'll do something about it. See, the necessity here pleaded for more grace and for more time. In John chapter 17 and verse 15, Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. See, Jesus is praying for you. He's prayed for his children to the Father that God would keep them from the evil. And the intercessor pleaded. There's many a church member still in the vineyard, the place of fruit bearing, but bears nothing. Bearing nothing. I want you to check your life. In 1984, did you glorify God? What did you do for the Lord in 1984? If I would ask you, are you saved? You'd quickly say, yes, preacher. I was saved. Some of you say, Preacher, you remember when I got saved in your tent meeting or in the church or someplace or, or by listening to the radio and the gospel? I, I got saved, Preacher, you know that. But what have you done for God recently? What did you do last year? Uh, how faithful were you a year before last and a year before that? This may be year number four when God has given you another chance. Who knows? And so you need to realize if you're saved, God's expecting something out of you. And this could be your fourth year. Now, three years, this tree was no good. It pretended. It grew up there. It produced nothing. How about the last three years of our lives? What have we done for God in the past three years? What if you had to face God today, this morning, and God looked back over the last three years of your life? Could you smile and say, Lord, I tried my best to glorify you. Or would you hang your head in shame? See, you don't know. You may face God today. I may face God today. And God may say, now I'm going to give you another year, 1985, and we'll see what you're going to do this year. God may have that in mind. This could be your year. Now notice the intercessor pleaded for more grace. Second, he promised more work in verse 8. I, he said, I will dig about it and fertilize it. Now let me ask you this question. Is God digging about your life? Is God digging around the roots of your being? Is something happened to you in the past weeks or months, a year or so that's really shaken you up? Is God right now digging something in your life that's putting you to thinking? God may have to dig around you in order to put you to thinking. Fanny Crosby, one of the greatest songwriters that ever lived. When she was a little girl, a doctor put some medicine in her eyes and Turned up totally blind. She never saw the light of day again. 
I've been to the little church yonder about 50 miles off New York City. When I was up there at a meeting, I went to the church where she played the little organ. I saw the organ where she played. A little small church. And Fanny Crosby said in her last days on earth, after she had written so many beautiful, beautiful songs that's been used of God and been used today, she said, I thank God that God Almighty let me be blind when I was just a child. That I might be totally used of him and write these beautiful hymns. And as they sing those songs today, her work is still going on. Yeah. I could mention men of God today, old Dr. B.B. Carwell, great Bible preacher, lost his son. His son was 19 years old, a brilliant sophomore at Furman University, killed on a motorcycle, never gained consciousness. Old Dr. Carwell liked to went crazy worrying about that boy. He'd go away in a meeting, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, he'd be walking in his hotel room saying, God, why? Why did you take my boy, 19 years old, brilliant young boy? I'd hoped that he'd be the one that preached the gospel. Lord, why? God began to speak to him and said, Son, I'm having to dig about you just a little bit. I want to use you. Now I want you to go forward doing your work in his too, and I'll bless you and use you. And Brother Caldwell would get relief when God would speak to him in that manner. And so God was digging about his life. I can mention others today that God really did dig around you and around your house and in your vineyard to shook you up and disturb you. Now, why did God do that? That you might glorify him. Who knows whose home and whose life God's going to dig around this year? Will he dig around mine? Will he dig around yours? A lot of times God had to do some deep digging at your house to get you to glorify him and to wake up. You'd hate to have to follow a little white coffin out on the cemetery in order to bring forth fruit unto God. You'd have to hate to have to say goodbye to a precious loved one or see someone afflicted in your family or some tragedy come your way or go bankrupt or lose everything you got in order to glorify God. You'd hate to see that. You won't have to face that. you glorify God. If God is digging about you, then he's doing it for a purpose. Maybe you won't have to dig. Maybe you'll produce the fruit. And then he promised more work and then he began to dig and he agreed that the result should be final. This intercessor said, Now, Master, after I've done all I can do, if this tree don't produce the goods, then we'll chop it down. Now, Jesus, our intercessor at the right hand of God, our great advocate, is said, Father, I'm going to do a little digging this year, a little fertilizing and a little blessing, and I'm going to work around that person, Father. And if they don't start glorifying me this year, at the end, then we'll just... Chop them off. We'll move them off the scene. We'll get them out of the way. Did you know there's some people in heaven tonight? Could be down your serving. I could stand your name up for an hour. People that's in heaven tonight could be down your serving God had they glorified God, but they didn't do it. After God began to dig around them, they still didn't do it, and God just cut them off and moved them out of the way. Now, don't let that be your case. And so he said, after that, if there's no fruit, if there's nothing done, we'll just cut her down. Beloved, glorify God you don't want to be cut out I don't want to be cut out let's glorify God as we sojourn for him there's a little boy one early one morning slept a little late for school his mother's a little late getting him ready she went to the door to see him off to the bus and he came to the door she just kind of shoved him and said son get moving you're going to miss the bus and a little fella took off toward the bus stop and he had to think of something mother hadn't kissed him goodbye that morning and he turned and ran back. He said, Mama, you didn't kiss me this morning. She just shoved him and turned around and said, You better go if you're going to catch that bus. She still didn't kiss him. That little boy was killed. And whenever they buried the little fella, the preacher was sitting there in the car with his mother, and she was weeping. And she told the preacher what happened. And she said, Preacher, I'd give everything I own or ever would own if I could take that little boy in my arms and kiss him. He said, Mom, you hadn't kissed me today, and I didn't kiss him, and that's the last time I saw the little fellow alive. I'd give anything, Mama, or preacher, rather, if I could take him one more time in my arms, a live little boy, and kiss those little lips. Anything I would give if I could do it. Let's stand our feet. Father, I pray today that you'll take the message, that you'll use it, that you'll speak to hearts, and stir up people to produce fruit this year to the glory of God. Our Father, I pray that you'll have your way in this invitation today. 
And may your name be honored. Lord, help us to glorify thee. May everyone in this auditorium that's saved and everyone that's saved in the radio listed arts, may they determine by the grace and help of God that they're going to glorify thee in this year. This year also, Father says our text, this year also, this year also. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Now, Debbie's going to play on the organ. As she plays, listen to me. If you're in this building unsaved, or if you're here backslidden on God, or if you're here and you want to join this church the way we receive members, or for any other reason you want to come forward, you may come, and we'll meet you right here and we'll help you. I feel like God may be speaking to someone today, whether you're a member or a you obey God this year also. God wants to use you. God wants to save you. God wants to do things for you. And while she plays, would you come? I've given you the message God laid on my heart. Now it's up to you to respond to the invitation. Are you doing what God tells you to do? 